Superior Court of California, County of Los Angeles, in the matter of the people of the state of California versus Orenthal James Simpson, case number BA097211. We, the jury in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime. You know what's wild and good good everything to everybody. Good, good everything. And everybody. everybody. Um, such a pleasure to be here with you. Um, you know what's wild that we're both old enough to have lived through some things. It's like, you know, my mama's generation remembers the day that Martin Luther King was shot. I'm not equating this, I'm just saying okay. that they're gen they're generational moments that you know I don't have any connection to other than you know history, history books. But I remember the NBA game being broken into with, you know, we were talking with, with Roderick Morrow and Karen Morrow yesterday, the black yeah, guy. Who yeah, yesterday, yeah. And he said they put the NBA finals in the little box. How about that? It was in the corner of the screen. Oh, wow. <laughs> it was yeah. like as we watched Al Cowley ride that Bronco. Uh, and he said, I thought we were going to witness a murder on the screen because a black man and it was a slow chase. Uh, I remember that in this case in the, you know, I, it was the first time I think I realized, really realized how divided this country was because I shared with the audience. I ran around the New York Daily News newsroom <laughs> like a fool. I thought about you in that interracial where the sister was celebrating and everybody else was sitting. Yeah. I thought about Yo, what you did she yesterday. Looked, she, looked like she was like, why is she, why is she <laughs> cheering too? That was my experience. I wasn't no. dirty yet, but I was like, I'm looking around, I'm seeing huddled masses of crying women in the corners crying. And I was confused in that moment because I thought everybody would be feeling what I was feeling. How naive, Dr. Carr, how naive. Their coverage hadn't given you a hint as to what would happen. Did, well, you know, the coverage was in my house. You know, my parents, we were watching, you know, Fact. our conversation. I mean, but you on the job, though. You were in that space. So. I was not plugged into mm -hmm. how they mm -hmm. were viewing this. I thought for sure the entire country would see this as, you know, finally an opportunity to see injustice done on the other side. I, whether y'all believed it or not, this was going to be that thing. And the case was, you know, with Furman, you know, how racist this man was, planting evidence and lying and his background with being racist, a racist cop. I was like, of course, you know, and Johnny Cochran, if the glove don't fit, you must have quit. We were like, come yes, come on, come on through, come, come on. on through. Come on. Oh my goodness. It come was on. it was wild. And, and in that moment when I was seeing people cry, I was confused. I was like, why are y'all attached to this? How long you, did it take you? Feel you? You know what I'm saying? It was <laughs> wild. Why did you? What did you? Yes. What do you have to do with this? What do you have to do with this? So how long did it take you to level set and say, oh, uh, oh not oh. well. 20 something year old Karen was way more not given an F, if you could believe that, <laughs> about what, what? Oh, was, no. <laughs> a little bit of a terror. What? Yeah, no, yeah, I didn't care. I didn't care. I was like, what you cry for? You know, it's like, I'm that person, right? Like, for? It's a problem. Yeah, for? I was off the chain. But yeah, I was, I, uh, years later, ended up writing a column, you know, kind of reflecting on that, you know, um, mm -hmm. because nobody wants to, well, people do. I don't. 
want to poke my finger in the face of, of pain and trauma and terror and whatever people were feeling in that moment. But it was to me one of those moments in America's history and, and, and was one of those touch points in our culture that really, to me, lifted the veil of like how this world, how this country deals with race and racial divide. This was a racial divide on the heels of a of a not guilty for police officers that beat the brakes off of Rodney King. And we witnessed that. Latasha oh, Harlins shot in the back of the you know, it's like and a jury then convicts her and the white woman the white, it's like mm, right. So I, I'm like, okay, so black life didn't we didn't even have words for it then. But yeah. we knew somehow um that if you can get wealthy enough <laughs> anyway. And, no, no, not anyway. And OJ had the money. OJ had the money. OJ, uh, his buddy, since they started playing tennis together in, I think it was 1970, uh, who, um, you know, his his close friend, who was a millionaire by them, he and his brother, who made his this boy made his money in music, and then went into other industry. I'm talking, of course, about the only reason we even know the name Kim Kardashian. And that would be, of course, Bob Kardashian. <laughs> I mean, he had the money. Yeah. The boy, and, the, and the, the connections. And the what connections. Brought an F. Lee mother freaking Bailey. God, oh. Johnny Cochran. I mean, that's well, like the dream team. Robert Shapiro. I mean, Robert Shapiro. Shapiro, Shapiro killed who, that. Yes. The boy called and said, I'm going to pay the bill. He called Shapiro and said, I'm paying the bill for OJ. And then Shapiro went out and, and gathered that team. And then, of course, by the time Cochran gets in, because OJ's in jail. He tells AC and him, look, I need Johnny Cochran. Well, because by then he has level set and realized Shapiro's a master in negotiating deals and stuff, but you ain't never tried no death penalty case. And so now I need him. And, and then after talking with Cochran, including uh the brother Carl Douglas and a sister, I think Sean is her last name, Colton, who was a lawyer who when it first broke, she said, Oh, he did it. And I hope he go to jail a long time. Because in the governance formation, black people were ambivalent about OJ, but once she realized what was going on, and then met with him in prison. She the one first one busts out crying, and then says, and then when she sees the autopsy, she said, "Now nah, he, he couldn't have, have done this. And they agree to take the case, and O.J. tells Shapiro, I want Cochran to lead it, and I want all y'all to do what he says. It is a fact. And this, this, of course, leads to the misquote, which he straightened up before he made transition. He said, y'all running around here talking about, I said, I'm not black, I'm O.J. He said, y'all took it out of context. He said, Johnny was talking about race, race, race. He said, I understand that, brother. But it, 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 it's ain't about black. And it, I, I'm OJ. I mean, I'm the one going to get the deal. <laughs> it, 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 it's like, y'all, we listen, today is a very personal day for all black people. And there's nothing that I've seen in mass com news commercial entertainment that is anywhere near what needs to be discussed in this moment. All these people are showing that you still can't talk about race in America. No. Well, we don't have, we don't, first of all, have momentum of memory, which we is what, not. We, is what do not. we do not. That's right. You know, having in class with Carr has even reminded me because many of us have forgotten some things, you know, and then to, to remember and then put it in place and then connect the dots. That's what this space is about. So it is so super valuable. There's nobody in media that can do it, even if they were around. Do you know what I'm saying? Whether they were in white face in media as I was, you know. Um, being my black self and white facing media, but I'm still under the 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 oppression of this is how you tell a story, right? This, this is what shaped all of that, right? Of course, of course. And so, you know, there's gonna and and today is just wild because everybody's about the clicks and the algorithms. It's not even about telling the truth, but they don't even hire people that have the institutional memory and the ability to be able to suss this out. How many people called you? A lawyer, I mean, a, a law Nobody, professor. No, nobody's gonna call me, but the I'm saying, a law professor with connections and yeah, yeah. Africana framing. Yeah, well, I'll tell you how how dull blood edged is that that footage that you just showed, which we've all seen most of or, or clips of that split footage. The two scenes of young black people were at Howard University. The first scene okay, was that. in Black Bernard Torian, but the second one, this blew my mind, Karen. Our friend Monique Presley was a law student at Howard University School of Law. That second one where they cheering, where they was praying like that, that's in the moot courtroom at the Howard University School of Law. Monique was there that day. She put it out on there. She said, I was a student at Howard Law. And I'm looking at professors. I'm, and all of those young people in that room now are attorneys in their 50s. 
This is one generation. You understand what I'm saying? Were any of them called to talk about that day? Of course not. Of course not. Because all those black people cheering are just dumb black people and not not clear about race. You know, you got you got an auditorium full of law professors and law students cheering because they watched a black lawyer put on a tour de force and tried to help. Chris Darden on the other side, but no, Chris wrapped up in the arms and imagination of Marsha Clark and his friends at the prosecutor office. People don't remember, maybe people don't remember, maybe they, maybe they knew. Jay Cochran, by, at that point, had never lost a case against the police in LA or the prosecutor's office. Now, Chris Darden was perfect. He had an 18, uh, he had won 18 convictions, but he had never faced Johnny Darden. Johnny I'm sorry, he never faced Johnny Cochran. And Johnny Cochran put that thing on him. This is not just if it fit, you must acquit, it was the voir dire, which Cochran writes about in his memoir. He said, we got six black jurors and they wanted me to quit. Shapiro, my own people, Carl Douglas said, hold on, man. But he kept going, kept pushing, kept pushing. They sweat. He goes page by page, juror by juror. And when they looked up out of the 12, eight were black. And he said, y'all wanted me to quit. Y'all wanted me to quit. And he said, no, you knew better, Johnny. Damn right, I know better. That's why he told me to leave the thing. They won that case in, in voir dire. They won that case in jury selection. You know what I'm saying? I said it was the black women, and this was I knew once mm -hmm. I found out the makeup. You know, Chris Darden clearly, you know, and this is this is also you know one of the issues when you are outside the framing of in the inside game because there's an inside outside game with black people. You know, and you could be on the periphery just because of your your leanings, your proclivities, your your desire to want you know white acceptance and forget home. This dummy put black women on the jury, got Marsha Clark thinking that a black woman's not going to see this man because he married a white woman. Like, like we care about that. And, <laughs> that was and, 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 like, and, and, and then got Chris Darden up there and both of them using language like, well, OJ had a, a, an obsession with uh, blondes with blue eyes. And then Johnny Cochran gets up and says, when we get this Furman testimony, we're going to use the N-word. Chris, D Chris uh, Darden got the nerve to get up and say, well, you know, the N-word, you know, this is a very it's volatile in our community. We don't know. And Johnny Cochran writes in his memoir, he says, so you saying you can use the buzzwords for white, but when we want to use the N word, black people can't stand hearing the N word. And of course, um, and we know, I mean, all almost all of them are in storage, but the ancestors got jokes because a couple aren't. And I'm going to show you all in a minute. But of course, Madam Foreman, uh, the, 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 the piece that the three sisters, three of the sisters who were on the jury wrote, y'all must think we stupid. You, you, we see y'all using these buzzwords for white, but then you didn't want to use the N word. They looking at Chris like, bruh. Man, this dude, he made so many mistakes. Johnny Darden trying to help him in the courtroom. Bro, I understand. Nobody wants to use this word. But, man, don't, don't do this to yourself, man, because you're going to be a pariah. And it, it, right. so you remember where you were. Yep. I remember where I am. Somebody in Nubia, Ralph, said he was at, waiting at a Red Lobster in Nashville. <laughs> and after it came on, he said, normally I would make $150 a day. He's in Nubia. Thanks, Ralph. And he said, every table I had that was white folk either didn't tip me at all or gave me change. One group actually wrote on the receipt, have OJ tip you. Oh, <laughs> oh my. You know what I'm saying? I mean, but this. Wait, wait let's pause there for a second, Dr. Carr. Good, uh, again, good morning, everybody coming in. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Look, this is why we got to thank you, Karen. This is the vision when you, I mean, this is why these are moments when we got to have this conversation. That's right. And I don't know anyone else that can other than borrowing from here and then going and making their own content off of that's the stuff right. that we talk about. But that's fine. We need it spread wide and far um, and, you know, whatever. But even saying that, so white people identified. <laughs> I mean, this, you know, you know, when Kyle Rittenhouse or no, worse, George Zimmerman, come on, when when he was found not guilty of killing Trayvon Martin, you know, if, if white folks want to. He killed him. He and killed, he killed him. him. Said he, right. killed him. He, he didn't get he didn't get oh, convicted boy. of murder or manslaughter, but he killed Trayvon Martin, and he and he, and he leaned into it. Yeah, I killed him, and got millions of dollars in donations. Come got on. you know, like when Darren Wilson killed Mike Brown. That's right. He got a million dollars in donations Come from on. people. So there's a culture in this country. Yeah, it's called a bounty. He got paid his bounty. White people paid the bounty because they hunt us. They paid the bounty. That white boy that killed George Floyd. No doubt he'll have a, when he gets out, he'll have a nice bounty. 
for that. These murderers, this, uh, the, the, these cops shooting 92 times into a car claiming that they got, they stopped him for a seatbelt violation except the windows were tinted. What did you see? If everybody kill you kill somebody black, you get a bounty. That's the bottom line. So Kyle, yeah, he got his little bounty. And now, and now he- Wait, they got him on speaker tour. I'm like- but really, y'all? I mean, this is this is the hill y'all want to die on. This is what you want to celebrate. This is your hero, you know. Like, yeah. so so that divide right there that that they wouldn't tip a black man. So they oh. they obviously make the alignment, but then I don't see color. Which is it? Which is it? Was this a racial case or was it a murder case? What was it? That. What was it? What was on trial? Both. Was it OJ on trial? Or were black people on trial? Listen, I mean, look. Ron Goldman, Nicole Brown Simpson were killed, were murdered in a savage way. Very savage. You know, maybe we will never know. But, you know, funny how, in fact, Johnny Cochran ends his memoir um, quoting, hold on to God's unchanging hand. And indeed, the first line of that song is true. Time is filled with swift transition. You never know whose tongue going to be loosened now that O.J. Simpson is, is an ancestor. You just don't know. And, and and so, you know, people think he did, people think he didn't, but a court of law, criminal law, said that he didn't. So they weren't satisfied until they could move into a civil case in Santa Monica, where the jury, jury pool was overwhelmingly white, and they chased O.J. Simpson for the rest of his life. When they got that judgment, sold the house, they bulldozed the house down. The white boy who had some of his stuff in storage, including his Heisman, says, well, I felt like it was mine because I had an arrangement that'd be paid either in money or or, or, mur or memorabilia. So I took the Heisman. It's my Heisman rubbing the head of the Heisman. So when OJ busts up in the hotel room with, with the strap and a couple of his boys like you got my mama's photo albums. Y'all took her piano. You wanted the piano. You wanted her house. And so I got him. Let's put him in jail. This thing was never loose, except he got loose again. They couldn't take the NFL pension, so the juice is loose. It wouldn't be satisfied. Now that he's dead, all you people, and I'm talking to our good friends who seem to think there is no such thing as race and who are watching right now, listen, you're going to have to let their whiteness go if you want to have a society where we can all live in. So the minute the man die and you praying him into hell or talking about, oh, yeah, blah, 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 and all this, and you see black people who live through it, most of us are silent. And don't engage you on that. But the younger we go, the more interesting it gets. Because when mm. we don't have the momentum of memory, this is where the joke's coming from. That's foolishness on the root and all that. Which is why I thought it was interesting. We were talking before we went live. You say, you know what? Let's bring this into here. Um, the conversation. And you know, like you say, everybody got a microphone now. I loved how you all were unpacking that yesterday. About how platforming now has created a situation where people just got to keep one up each other. One up in each other. With these hot takes and these hot takes. But I thought it was interesting, a convergence of the everybody. Yeah, that, that, was, that was Lamont. I just want to give him. Oh, yeah, Lamont. No doubt. No doubt. Lamont King, which which I loved how you were balancing. It was a very governance conversation in a in a social structure form because the whole world is listening to you as, you know, he was going to crack a joke. Sir, to some women, hold up. Let me, let me pull you back a little bit. <laughs> not, not today. We're not going to. It was a beautiful thing to hear because we had to balance it because this is the thing that that forces us to have to balance. But I heard something I think many of us did unvarnished yesterday um that it is what it is podcast with uh cameron and mace uh and and the young sister um treasure wilson also known as baby stat they did a tribute to who the man they call uncle o it was very interesting because it was like and they had it was very interesting the third the, the fourth person on it in addition to those three was uh Maurice Claret. Remember Maurice Claret? Claret? Wow. See, see, see the look on your face. A lot of people don't know. Mm -hmm. tell them, no, please. No, no. <laughs> and, and, and but I think the reason why OJ, I think his last interview was with them. Mm -hmm. Right. They had him on every Monday, yeah. apparently. Since oh, I, I didn't even know that. Okay. They so haven't watched any NFL was... football, but what they, okay. they reached out to him last year and during the That's season crazy. last year, after every game on Monday, OJ was their guest breaking down football fascinating oh and they played God. some of the clips at the end of like hour and a half show i showed my students and we'll talk about this later but i showed my students the clip where cameron says to oj look man i'm from new york i'm from he named the street and then oj leaned forward 
And OJ was like, yeah, I'm from Material Hill Terrace, but I'm from the projects too. And I know how to put my N-word suit on too. And then he said, and then, and then he says, and I, and I ain't the only projects I've been in. He leans into the camera. And then camera said, yo, wait, hold on. I don't want no smoke from you. I don't, the students are cracking up. I'm thinking to myself, two human beings lost their lives. And it's a real tragedy. But whiteness has blocked our capacity to even balance it out and talk about our common humanity because y'all have gone so hard in the paint on crucifying not just O.J. Simpson, but by proxy, all of us, yes. that it engenders a kind of thing. Well, well, hell, I ain't going to stand here and get keep hitting the chin. I got to put my dukes up. So guess what? If you want some balance in this, you got to give up that whiteness. And watching these young people and the young lady, Ooh. baby stat, she said, I was born in 2001. So the only OJ I know is the caricature. And it real, and then I realized, oh, Cameron and Mace are older than Maurice Claret, who's older than Wilson. Right. And so then they started breaking down how, oh no, no, we got to tell you, this is how, this is what wow. it's fascinating to watch these wow. young people. And then all of a sudden they weren't all young people, they were generations. And she wow. said, I mean, it was really something, wow. but, but the one thing they had in common, they said. You know, this man that we know, and that's what she said. The OJ I know is the one that's on the show. And then she said, I don't know why y'all don't have. And then Mace was like, people have to be allowed to have their humanity. She, and then Cameron was like, look, that was the first time I've seen in my life where we went in the system and the system worked for us. And she said, y'all mad. Why y'all still mad? This, I thought y'all love the system. Oh, y'all don't love it. You love when it worked for you. It was very yeah. interesting to hear this kind of... <laughs> anyway. you know, as you're talking, I'm thinking Trump is proxy for mm. white people. You know, like, and that's why they go hard and pay for him. And, you know, and, and the ability to be able to understand that, you know, yeah. OJ wasn't... Guilt and innocence wasn't... That wasn't what we were litigating. And no. we're still not. I still won't even... Still you not. know, we, why? Why are we going to do that? We're not. But yes. it was a proxy for how so many black and it's black men in particular. When I mean, you think about New York City uh, recently, stop and frisk, you know, black people have been harassed, black men in particular. OJ was a proxy for every black man has ever been harassed in L.A. Notorious. We're not even talking Rodney King was just on camera. How many black men got the brakes beaten off of them and didn't have lawsuits that they were able to file and just took that ass whooping or worse, went to jail on some trumped up charges uh, with some lying ass cops that are planting if Furman planted on OJ, like what the hell was happening in LA? We know because the reports have come out about yeah. LA. The black reports women, have come out. Black men, black men, black right. women. Black women busting up in their house, tearing up everything in the house, claiming you looking for drugs. And you, why did you have to slash the couch? Why you had to destroy the bedroom and the bathroom and the kitchen? Why did you? No, because y'all, Black life is not. Cameron made that point too. He said that. He said, wow. you know, it was very interesting. He said, I've been watching this stuff on mass media. And then Cam and then Mace was like, I ain't watch anything because I ain't wanted to color what we were going to talk about today. Cameron said, All you black people out here talking in mass media, sounding like them. A bunch of Uncle Toms, and then they started roasting all the black commentators. <laughs> they was like, "Cause y'all know this is not what we were saying, but y'all trying to keep your job, you trying to curry favor." He said, "Y'all are worthless." And I thought to myself, "Cause I mean, as you've made this point over and over again over the, the time that we've all been in this space, and before that, but certainly here, you know, journalism is gone. But watching these commentators, these black commentators, because this other thing he said." White commentators, I don't expect nothing of y'all. I hear this. I mean, you watching, you reading the headlines, you looking at TV. Oh, yeah, oh, oh, a murder. Okay. But you black people, really? This is what y'all going to do at this moment? And, of course, Uncle Tom caught a stray because Josiah Henson was nowhere like the stereotype. But that ain't the point. But th the point they were making is you can't even say what you're thinking with your whole chest. Or worse still, that might be what you think. Shout out to the uh, Trump operatives who had him pinned up in the Onward Christian Soldier, Chick-fil-A in I a know, setup. But that anyway. So wild. And <laughs> thank you. I mean, but, but on some point, uh, you know, that was social journalism. Discovered that young lady who was sure did. Work, work with Candace Owens and Blexit and has a whole organization devoted to, you know, this black, you know, Blacks for Trump movement in there talking about this is Morgan. This is Morehouse. And I know Morgan and Morehouse like, how are we in it? Like, yeah, oh, no, 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 Morris Brown. He said, "This is right. Morris Brown. This is Morris Brown." Nah, she did. She did. She did her job. But I mean, it, it was a moment. It is a moment where we realized the 
the real central importance of what we're doing and what all of us, I mean, everybody in here right now has to do, which is have shift the conversation and deal with the nuance. There are no good guys or bad guys completely. As John Clark says, some stories, there are no good guys. That includes commentators. That includes because, you know, I'm sitting there listening to them, whatever beef that folk had with the Diddy and, and whatever. I mean, you know, there's a whole lot of drama there. And it's funny. May said this. Uh, he said, you know, I have my own issues with people wanting their stuff back or me wanting stuff back and not getting it or people not getting things from me. And I thought to myself, yes, you do, son. And I'm thinking, you know, so, I mean, it, it and doesn't read Revelations. There's Life After the Line by uh, Mason Betha <laughs> <laughs> with Karen Hunter. <laughs> come on now. Come on now. No, come on back. Because you got to explain that really because I think it's important for us to understand that it's complicated. So, so does it surprise you at all, in fact, that they would have this position toward a man who... Oh. No, no, no. And, and, you know, when Mace was out um, with Puffy, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people thought he was not smart because he was all, oh, Mace be the one that, you know, it was very, <laughs> no, no. very, very monosyllabic. Um, but I, that I just can't stand looking in that. Yeah, oh, my God. <laughs> I, I got to spend a lot of time with him mm. right in the midst of the trauma, mm. you know, where most of us, when we are fearing our lives, run to to God. And, you know, he was, uh, you know, starting a church, uh, went to his church, you know, a handful of people in a in a little storefront, you know, with folding chairs. And he was very sincere and very um, not it's completely, you know, telling all of the truths. But I knew that it was centered in something ain't right here. My life is on a line. I don't want this anymore. I love the Lord. You know, there was all of this, you know. And so we did this book, which was wild because the publishers didn't promote it at all. And it still is one, it's, it sold a lot of copies despite having no press tour, no no money behind it, not, nothing. And I was stunned by it. Cause I'm like, he's dropped some bombs in here. And it still did very well, despite despite the publisher not putting any anything behind it at all. Um, but I knew in that moment, it's very, very, thoughtful person at that time like he's 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 evolved of course he's a man he's a full man uh he was still very young then but you think about um the experiences that he's seen you know and had and the truth that you know you have to come to when everyone else is is projecting a lie we're living in a world where lies are projected every day and we are forced to accept it as a black people more than anybody have lived in hypocrisy and we figured out that we just accept it, you know, some of us don't, some of us don't, and some of us pay dearly for not. But for the most part, we just go, okay, and we know internally this is a lie, whether it's in our homes, with how our families are presented, you know, a lot of us are living lying lives, but it's mm. de the default, right? It's, mm. it's how, we, how we have been conditioned because, what, you know, when you don't have power, you, you have to accept things, right? Or you don't. You lose, you lose everything, including your life sometimes. So um, Listen, do you think that the, again, something y'all bring up yesterday in this context. And yesterday was food since Friday. So this is, we're going to bring up stuff, but it's going to be in the framework of. Oh, it was in the, yeah, oh, no question. But I mean, again, I think, and again, another master class being taught in how to balance the fullness of our humanity, because, you know, for people to continue to remind us that two human beings lost their lives. You don't ever, let's just be very clear about this. You don't ever have to remind black people of loss of life. Cause if you want to do that, then let's please, let's dance till your whole body falls off. Do you really want to talk to us about loss of life? Do you really want to start that conversation? No, you don't. What you talking about is a loss of white life. Let's be very clear about that. Let's be very clear about that because it seems to me that I remember O.J. Simpson had a child that drowned. Mm -hmm. He was not even at home. He was married to Marguerite in, in the swimming pool. I, and I read that in Jet Magazine. Come on. And, and you know, you talked about that yesterday. Say some, I mean, they, they were on the cover. It seems like they were on the cover like every year. You right. know, Marguerite and the children, they were, you know, O.J. And even later, you know, Jet Magazine was where we got our news. That's right. Like, that was weird. But, you know, my mama kept every Jet and Ebony, you know, it was like to this day. 
I still, you know, could put my hands on a jet or ebony from the 1970s and 80s. Yes. But yeah, it was it was that was where I was introduced really to the inner workings of of an OJ Simpson's life because we got to see the 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 home and the family and you know the stories in there. So and the and the battle that 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 tension, that class tension that jet and ebony represented in in this in the in the effort to promote what might be considered the quote unquote best in terms of economic class of us, the homes and the celebrities, you know, and still balance that with representing the rest. I mean, Emmett Till America. was, was it Jet or Ebony? Absolutely. Where absolutely. we got the first picture of Emmett Till in the casket? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so I wonder, and this is where I'm going with this question I want to ask you from those days, which we both remember having been born into that and raised in it where quote unquote platforms consisted of almost bottlenecks, certain publications, radio stations, perhaps, you know, news outlets. And then as we became adults and grew into it, even with the limited number of television stations, the black, you know, Tony Brown's journal or, you know, in the New York area, like uh, it is like it is with the great G G Gil Gil Noble. Noble. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and, and uh, soul, of course, Ellis Hazlett, you know, the, <laughs> With that, <clears throat> even our entertainment, Soul Train and those kind of things. Fast forward to where we are now, where everybody with access to an uplink can be talking at once. Do you think that the things that evoke the the survivalist humor that y'all do tap into so well on Foolish Despise, you think they were ever not there? Or is it just that now we can see everything that the conversations that, you know, Jet was there, Ebony was there. And then you go to the beauty parlor, the barbershop, the jokes were still being cracked. You know what I'm saying? But nobody had an internet. That, you know, I don't know. I'm wondering what. You know. I, I, I felt like even, even, a you know, Jet and Ebony, you know, wove, they wove in, into the content. It wasn't all serious, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I had da Danielle Pinnock on and she said her dream was to be a, a one of the jet, jet. Um, her, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I was like, come on beauty, through. Beauty of the week. Right. Yeah, beauty of the week. You talk about, you know, pinning them up on, you know, a lot of boys in, in our the wallpaper at every black barbershop. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, so they always had a way of, of giving us all of that. And if we're being honest, black people, that has, a, has been a coping mechanism. I mean, oh, oh. my dad and I, it was never were serious <laughs> when there was some serious you know whether we were in church at a funeral there was gonna be some jokes crack and no you know problem. there was there was a a uh tick tock or something going around you know when big mama dies you know you pour out you know this is the the transition we're gonna play some cards we're gonna right, pour right. out a little liquor we're gonna eat first that at the <laughs> repast then there's gonna be you know the the circle of rem you know remembrance that would be with the jokes right yes, because yes. that's how we that's our mental health and you know, um, Lamont was even saying now it's like everybody that uh, no, it was actually Roderick Morrow who was like, yeah, this OJ with the jokes on late night. I mean, you think about Leno, like every, the late night people were joking. So you want us to have some sensibilities around two people losing their lives when late night was making fun Come and on. having jokes. Come on. You and know, they got all the jokes now, all the jokes. Keep that same energy. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, so the hypocrisy is, you know, certain people get away with things, and now it's like everybody's like, nope, 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 nope. We all gonna do it. Genie's out of the bottle. You can't put it back. Can't put it back. And or, this or, or you could try, but you yeah. lose, well, you never had any credibility with us. And that I think that's what the O.J. Simpson verdict revealed as well is that there is no. Not only is there not a we, there's no nation. I keep saying, no, this is a country with a lot of different nations in it, and so no, there, there's no common framework. No, I, 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 I remember, um, you know, while the world continues to spin, by the way, I see you, Nelson, in Nubia chat. So yesterday, Mohella informed me all my federal student loans have been discharged for giving. Great birthday gift on my 42nd birthday today. Show is, man. Happy birthday. Got that debt forgiven, huh? Yeah, them white nationalists, boy, they don't, they don't, they mad at y'all. They get, they need, they need those billions for their billionaire friends so they can give them them tax cuts. And pay. shout out to all of the uh, Congress people that are complaining about it and took the PPP loans so and got forgiven to the tune of millions of dollars. No so it's, again, once again, we're seeing it's okay for me and it's not okay if, if anybody else gets it. It's That's my exactly. right as a white man to have this. This is my birthright. It's, it's my right. It's yes. my right. As, as the, uh, 
as the diminutive little impish looking white boy who probably couldn't even lift the Heisman Trophy that he had stolen, uh, said at the time he was being interviewed on L.A. television. He said, I took the Heisman. I figured it was mine. So uh, all these PPP loans, you took them PPP loans. They fit, you figured that was yours. That's why they sent you to Congress to steal. But somebody else, you know, is like, wow. He said, well, only a small percentage of people go to college and get these loans. They don't pay off. Why should we pay for them? He said, yeah. So why should we be paying for the less than 1% of people who get the tax breaks? Why should we be paying for them? Your logic doesn't uh, matter. But again, it's not about logic. And, uh, you know, in fact, it's about this deep, visceral embrace of whiteness. So Johnny Cochran, one of the great lawyers of his time, uh, next year, it'll be 20 years since he made transition. Hard to believe it's taking that, going that quickly. When he beat you in the courtroom, you saw white nationalists. Uh, shout out to Jerry Seinfeld. What do you do? Oh, you go draft somebody and make up a mock uh, Johnny Cochran in a mock New York where ain't no black people. And the only black people you put on screen are uh, comic uh, minstrel foils. Shout out to J.B. Smoove and uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm, which ended its, 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 its uh, run last week. But, you know, minstrels. And so you make a minstrel uh, Johnny Cochran. Greg Morris's son, I think, played him. You know, anything, you know, you, you trying to belittle the uh, the legacy of Johnny Cochran. But we're going to fix that. We're going to fix that uh, today uh, when we talk a little bit about Johnny Cochran and let him tell his own story. Because this O.J. Simpson case, this O.J. Simpson case is not about, as you say, Karen, it's not about killing. It's about race. That was the point of entry. And, and, and those of us who are old enough to remember, who were adults especially, we all remember. I, I remember um, when the Rodney King verdict was read. I was at Ohio State. I was a graduate student. I think I told you that story before. But when and and and, and that the next that day, uh, the next day actually, because we watched as CNN and everybody else covered the uh, verdicts that let those cops go. And as the sun went down in L.A., L.A. went up in flames. The Mall of America went up in flames in Minnesota, underground Atlanta got busted into and, P and then CNN stopped covering live and went to kept feedback loop, kept looping because it's almost like the bat signal went up. Black people were like, oh, this will be doing. Then let's do it. So there we are in 1992, 1995, three years later, as you say, the the the, the uh, in between that, of course, was the the the. the the car chase, the June car chase. And many of us remember that too, as you say. I mean, that Bronco coming down the, the 404 and the, the triangle, the pie wedge of cop cars behind. And uh, I, in fact, we did this in, in class on Thursday because we just got the news earlier Thursday and I had my hip hop class at Howard on Thursday. And we finished the book, the last book we were reading and they worked on their final papers. And I said, you know, this is why y'all come to a HBCU. And then more importantly now, because we have jailbroken the black university, this is why we come in this space. So that in the chats and YouTube and the chats and Nubia, the chats, we archive, we share with each other our feelings, our discussions, debates. We share what we were feeling. A lot of people are filling up both chats now with where they were and how they felt and all of those things. And it's very important that we do this because it's not going to come from social structure media. And as we were talking on Thursday, you know, I told them, I said, you know, I remember that I, at the time I was at Temple, Temple University. I was working for my man, Charles Bloxon. I was in the Bloxon collection and the collections librarian still on the case up there in Philly, Eslaku uh, Bahanu, our sister, my Ethiopian sister. She's a, the head librarian at, at the Bloxon collection still. And Eslaku was in there and I was in there. And the students were coming in. It's a special collection. They're doing their research. These undergraduate students, you know, Temple is not an HBCU. In fact, they were one of the schools I used to I joke with them a few years ago. They, they had this T-shirt that I started seeing showing up at some of these schools with a lot of black students like Temple HBCU-ish. That's what they had. No, it's not. It's no such thing as HBCU-ish. Shout out to Deion Sanders and his crew. You can't, you know, those are not HBCUs. And if you think they're HBCUs because you did a little, you wiggled your tail a little bit, then you really don't understand what HBCU is. But at any rate, the students were coming in, headed to the student center on campus in North Philly there. And of course, they were headed there for the same reason three years before 
the students were headed to uh, came over to the Black Culture Center at Ohio State, where I was the graduate assistant, because we had a big TV. This is before everybody had the television in the palm of their hands. So you had to go and convene. Um, the car chase was a little different because it took place in the afternoon into the evening. And as you say, Karen, as we all remember, those of us old enough to remember, the, the Rockets were playing. Was it the beloved New York Knicks? I'm trying to remember. Nope, it was the Knicks. Game six, wasn't it? So you, so like you said, how do you put Elijah Wan versus Ewing in a little? How did you not pat Ewing and a, a team Elijah? Wan? The Knicks trying to play for the first championship since Willis Reed. <laughs> he got knocked off the, by a slow moving white Bronco. Ninety five million people watched that car chase. That's never going to happen again. At least we don't know. I mean, but then again, 150 million watched the verdict. Can you imagine that? No. In a place that didn't have 300 million people at that time. Half the people in the United States of America watching this because that paradigm has been exploded. And of course, with the car chase, I was telling the students it's in the hip hop class. I remember where I was. I was at home, watching the game, and I had on in the background Cosmic Kev, who was the hip hop DJ and broadcaster on power whatever it was power 98 power 99 in philly and it was it was it was surreal to watch the bronco and to hear these commentators but then a lot i did what probably a lot of us did if you had access to somebody talking about it other than that because before the internet i turned down the television and was listening to cosmic kevin and them talking because they had it on in their studio and they was like this is bananas yo we are here trying to play this hip hop music, and now we watching OJ. Is he gonna kill himself? They say he's in the car. We don't know. It was it was fascinating. So fast forward a year to the trial, and so you know I started the class by telling them, you know where I was, and 1995, I'm 20, 29 years old, graduate student working in the collection, and these young people, these undergrads who were my students, I was a teach, I was I was teaching that. At Temple at the time, they're coming in saying, Greg, you're going over to the student center. I said, It's like we should we go? Should we shut now? And she said, Oh, I don't know. I don't know whether we should go. Greg, what do you think? I said, I don't know. But as they were coming in, one young lady came in, she taking off her earrings. What you doing? Braces. I don't want nothing pulled because it if they say guilty. And these white kids start cheering. I'm murdering everything moving in North State. I said, wow. I said, Lock, I gotta go over there now. I mean, because these kids get ready to kill somebody. If if they're white, if those white students start cheering, even those children, I say children, even these young people knew. You know who was in school? Ajua. Aju was in school. Mm. It's an undergrad at that temple. They was going over there because they had to go find some place. Where some of them didn't have TVs in their dorm room. You know, he's a, this is when students were struggling now. But you, in fact, I want to say I don't know whether or not. No, no, she had graduated by then. Arnell Simpson graduated from Howard. That's where Johnny Cochran first had his long, long conversation with OJ because a family friend of his, their daughter, graduated from Howard, and they had a party in Georgetown. That's what Johnny Cochran said. Me and OJ really struck up. I had seen him before, but. We helped put the party on where his daughter, who was a Howard graduate, a couple of years before. So, at any rate, so when they said not guilty, everybody celebrated. And so then, with that background, I then played Jay Z, the story of OJ, <laughs> because for this generation of young people, they don't remember uh, an, an NC two A Heisman Trophy All American tailback. They don't remember. Any more than the people who watched O.J. Simpson in the 60s as an all-American, all-everything running back for USC. Uh, any more than they remembered uh, the generation before them in some ways. Because the generation before them, the, the star tailback wasn't at USC, but it crossed town rival UCLA. His name, of course, was Jack Roosevelt Robinson. Uh, Jackie Robinson, Robinson Day is coming up. Uh, you know, April has Jackie Robinson Day where everybody wears the number 42 in Major League Baseball. And as my students certainly didn't know, and as many people here do know, and maybe some of the young people don't, you know, baseball arguably was not Robinson's best sport. Uh, football, you know, football and track like his brother Mac before him at UCLA. But that was a generation before OJ Simpson. 
And so we played, you know, something they do know, which is the story of OJ from Jay Z's 444 album. We talked about it. One N word, two N word, rich N word, poor N word, all you know, the N word flying freely. Sorry, Chris. But, oh, <laughs> it was interesting because <laughs> Cameron and Mace and, and, and Baby Stat were saying they were enjoying OJ. He's giving commentary every Monday, this kind of thing. But early on, they said, he said to them off camera, off show, listen, man, y'all sure use the N word a lot. Do y'all have to use this OJ, right? And they were like, oh, well, you know, we thought maybe he was admonishing us or whatever. But he's, uh, well, it was Mesa Camera. I said, somewhere around episode eight, week eight when he was on, he said, even light skin N words got to zip up their N word suit every once in a while. And they said, oh, 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 oh okay. And that's, and they said, that's what we knew. Oh, OJ was hood. He from them projects in San Francisco, right? Is that the hill to die on, the N word? I'll tell you a hill he didn't die on, and those were those projects he was from. Puerto Rico Hill Terrace. We'll talk about that in a minute because that place has been gentrified. We're gonna get to the governance formation in a minute. But as I said, we opened up with 444's the story of OJ. So they could we could talk about it. And that allowed a point of entry to talk about OJ. And as I said, in taking stuff to storage, you know, it's amazing how the ancestors say, I'm gonna leave you a few things because if it was a book written on OJ, I, I'd have it. You know, I mean, oh, you know what, Prof, I want to ask you this, because the book I'm about to mention is written in people. Some people consider it the best book on OJ. I don't believe in a best book on OJ, but it, it's a solid book in terms of what happened in the court and in the reporting. Although I do like uh, this one. I did have American Tragedy, the Uncensored Story of the Simpson Defense. This is pretty good. Lawrence Schiller and James Willworth, uh, report from Time Magazine and a beat reporter who was in the, the courtroom. The, the, the TikTok in this, the day by day is excellent. In just terms of you know shoe leather reporting, the kind of stuff you train your students to do, uh, Pra. But the book that many people mention, of course, is Jeffrey Tubin's Run for Your Life. Bro, mm. how many media people who people know yes. today did OJ Simpson give birth to? Star Jones. Star Jones. Star Jones. Damn. It's amazing to me. Certainly Jeffrey Tubin, who was around. But not the CNN legal correspondent, not the uh, New York or the Atlantic correspondent. I mean, before he tripped. But then again, he gets a second and third chance. Of course, murder wasn't involved. I mean, it's only his penis. Only his penis. Right. Penis murder. I mean, but, you know, did it anybody. But again, you just wait a minute here. I see Chris Matthews creeping back up. Mm -hmm. in. Shout out for Joe Scarborough. If you're a white man, you get unlimited chances. Right? Come on. Of course, but uh, and then, of course, uh, wait, Caitlin, is it Caitlin Jenner? Bruce? Bruce Jenner was then what with the accident? What are you talking about? Yeah, there, there was there was some there was some killing involved in his background. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I mean her know. background. Sorry, her background. No, but I, this was before transition, before full oh, well, transition. Okay, so okay. We, I mean, we got to be appropriate, right? No question. Before, no question. Before transition, driving on a uh, car uh, hit a Lexus that then spun into traffic and was hit by a Hummer, killing uh, a few people, and then had the audacity, Caitlyn did, to mm -hmm. comment on OJ. And then got, you know, gathered and reminded because some people have moments of memory and then said it's not the same. The, the brutal killing of of of, you know, Nicole, because he was he was at the time sitting in the court on Nicole uh, Simpson's side, right, which, right. you know, because Chris Jenner, which also um, I published Chris Jenner and all things Kardashian. Could um, you please pop in. Let me pop in. Let me pop in. Come on, talk to us. And spent extensive time with Chris Jenner talking on, about now. this very case. The very case is I, you know, edited and um put that book out. Uh bestseller, by the way, Chris Jenner and all things Kardashian. Um, this was the 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 smoking gun, so to speak. She had a lot of details in that book that no one had ever known, including pictures. And Nicole was a central figure in in that book in, in addition to her marriage to rob kardashian wow. senior yeah senior. yeah and all of that the, all of the case all of the back stories were in that book so my god so see yeah. this is why this is where wow i feel like important. forrest gump right now but you know no 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 no, no. <laughs> big, big <laughs> the forrest gump who did not was did not exist or waldo who did not exist Karen does exist this is oh the importance yeah this is, you know this is crazy so you know now you gotta you know, look, on the hub, we're going to need an essay or something. I mean, because we don't have this. 
people are getting blitzed out there with foolishness and thinking they talk. You y'all, y'all ain't got no idea. You know, it's wild. I'm I'm trained <laughs> not to do what everyone is doing, so it's it's a, it's a it's a weird position to be in to know so many things. My conditioning is you you take these things to your grave. You don't talk about these things. You don't write a tell all. You don't talk about the things you know about the people that you've done projects with because that's inappropriate, right? So mm. you let the project speak for themselves. Supposed to strange but place. in this day, in this day, in in this day and age, it, it, I mean, everybody's talking. I mean, uh, somebody's got to, I think, set the the clock back. Uh, you know, set it right, and at least be the model for what that looks like. You know, it's true. It's true, uh, but maybe, maybe it's not me. I don't know. I'm just like I, I just. Ugh, it, it's so. Ooh, it's so distasteful mm. when I see it. You know, mm. and you know what is also distasteful when I see journalists get so wrapped up in the subjects that they have formed relationships. That's the other thing. I've seen that so many times. There's so many yeah. books and things written with people that had like personal relationships with, you know, there has to be some distance there so you can be objective enough to ask the questions that need to be asked and not be worried about the friendship or in, in some cases, the sexual relationship that you're in with people. I'm like, you, 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 you were in a relationship with that person. Y'all, y'all did a book together and you are a journalist. This is so oh. weird. It's so, so weird to me. This is what the standard you've been saying it. I mean, with the with this the killing, the strangulation of journalism by social media and the hot take industry, you know, the idea of how to curate that. I suppose it, it's like we keep saying we keep Listen, saying it, it, as a, if Clarence Thomas won't recuse himself, you know, so so if I'm a journalist right now, hell, Clarence Thomas is not recusing himself. I'm not gonna recuse myself. I'm gonna I'm gonna make this money and I'm gonna do this. Is it? This is the wild place we're in when there's no you no know, there's no respect for right and wrong. Like mm -hmm. you should recuse yourself from every case and actually step down because you're a disgraced Supreme Court justice. But he's doubling down on it. This is the world. The hypocrisy that we're living in right now is so crazy. We got Duke taking back a scholarship that really benefits 20 to 25 students because hey. of affirmative action and your whole university is built on slave money. And you, I mean, it's just, it's I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm all for it. You should take all those scholarships. Including and black athletes. Ones. Exactly. Right. Take all the black athlete scholarships. All you black athletes that were going to go play for the blue devils, the Duke brothers, tobacco plantation money, take your talents right down the road to North Carolina central university That's right. and tell them since you don't want, me here, I'm not dribbling any basketballs for you either. See, these white boys going to play with the right fire in a minute. And all it's going to take is one or two or five or six, as we've been saying in these uh, in these weeks. And, of course, this is our first live gathering since Don Staley and uh, her nine rotation deep squad uh, gave that work. A freshman and sophomores. Right? Come on now. My young girl's like, yeah, y'all mean me last year. I'm shutting the white girl down second half. You can take a rest, CC. And, and they gonna get going go get your name, image, and likeness stuff together because uh what we're not gonna do is have a repeat of your of your flute last year. That young, I mean, you know, it, 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 it's heart. Well, I won't say it's heartbreaking, maybe that's too much of a word, but it certainly tugs on your heartstrings in a governance formation to see a young person, a young sister who was tortured for a year as a meme because this, this other player waved her off. Like, I don't even need to check her. And then they have to spend, and then, but for her not to just be in her feelings about that, but to say, no, I'm going to get better. And to have a coach like Dawn Staley um, and her, and her, and her, and her whole squad to say, if you want to be the person to go out and, you know, be the superstar and score 30 points a game, this is not for you. But if you want to be part of a team in a different way, this is for you. And that's no, and she was not dissing. She's not disrespecting anybody. Oh, by the way, footnote, all of the energy, all of it for Caitlin Clark, great player, shoots lights out. Hopefully she'll do that in the WNBA from the logo, because if you get a little closer, these are going to be a little bit different kind of defenders. So although she will be playing, of course, with one of Don Staley's best there at the center position, if she gets need is, of course, she will be drafted first. But um, the footnote I was going to mention is, Everybody, all you sports writers out here, the same energy, the exact same energy, maybe even a little more, maybe, but, but keep that same energy. Keep that same energy for Juju Watkins, who scored more points as a freshman than Caitlin Clark did. And if she stays four years, might break her record. So, I mean, just keep that, that, that same energy. 
Because what the O.J. Simpson verdict, again, forced everybody to focus on is that there is in this country the thing that bind this country together as a country is white supremacy. You don't care. And by you, I mean everybody who embraces white supremacy, and that would include a lot of non-whites who think somehow it's in their best advantage, which brings us again to the question of if you are a journalist, or you're a truth teller, or you're looking for the facts, now is not the time to, to bend yourself into a pretzel as many of y'all have been doing over the last 48 hours to try to say something that, you know, you got to go in there and rinse your mouth out with mouthwash rather than try to uh, explain because you just, you're shrinking to the moment. This is an important moment, particularly for our young people who don't remember. Um, so, yeah, okay, Star Jones, Jeffrey Tubin, Nancy Grace, huh? W would you consider Nancy Grace a journalist? Hell no. Okay, so. No, so absolutely not. Dan Abrams, not a journalist. No. <laughs> Anderson Cooper, not a journalist. Okay. So, I'm just going to say it. No, but, no, but, but, but what shifted, y'all were talking about this a little bit yesterday. What shifted with the O.J. Simpson trial relative to this whole concept of reportage that then got blown apart in the smithereens as this kind of reality TV sensationalistic. Because mm -hmm. didn't the uh, founder of TMZ, wasn't he a commentator? Yeah, he was a I'm commentator. a lawyer. Yeah, Harvey, uh, whatever his name is, Harvey. He's a lawyer. Well, talk to us about, well, was the Simpson case that much of a paradigm shift or opened up to, I don't know. So it gave rise to people who had a little bit of law degree, a little bit of law knowledge, yeah, but a whole lot of television presence. So this, to me, you know, we've always had news readers, you know, sure, I mean, sure. Bernie Shaw, Bernard Shaw, but you know, there was, Walter Cronkite was reading, you know, but there was an, a sense of integrity to the truth in those early iterations of folk that, you know, sit in front of a camera and read content, you know, because they yeah. were also involved in shaping the content. Do you yeah. know what I'm Robert, saying? By the way, you saw Robert McNeil uh, made transition at 93. Oh, I didn't see that. A couple that. of days, yeah, McNeil there report. To your point, there's a certain standard, whether you agree with everything or not, but yeah, uh-huh. So we yeah. all had those. Yeah, so now it's it's 24 hours a day, you know, so like we're, we're on, we, we're going to get as many experts. So this was the rise of the expert uh, commentator, the analyst, sort of like in sports, you have your color commentator and you have the person that's, you know, telling you what's happening, the X's and the O's. This was similar to that. It was a sporting event, you know? So you're going to bring your best analysts, your best color commentators on to talk about it. And let's make sure we have, okay, we got diversity. We got Star Jones. We're going to have all these other people, Harvey Levin. We're going to have Dan Abrams and Nancy Grace because she's Dan over Abrams, the top. Right. Yeah, she's over the top. She's very, you know, uh, she's going to give it to you in this very, you know, no nonsense way. And, you know, this is why I asked the question. Somebody with deep knowledge like you should be the first person called because you, Either you want entertainment or you want to yeah. inform. But in both those worlds, that would be you. And it was you, except when they shrank from you, like NMSNBC. By oh, then, yeah. it right. had been curated. Because I'm still trying to figure out how Greta Van Susteren got a career launch, ah. given her, uh, as uh, Gil Scott Heron once said of uh, Rosalind Carter, uh, her uh, face lifted catatonia. But, I mean, how did Greta Van Susteren, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to catch a straight a, a recent ancestor, but then again, hey, it is what it is. Gil Scott Heron said that. But at any rate, uh, how did Greta Van Susteren launch a career, you know what I'm saying? Child. <laughs> and I, I got him, though, because I was under the impression that they wanted this truth. <laughs> Right, 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 right. Yeah, I, I was under the impression. I was like, oh, oh, y'all don't want the truth, truth. Like, I was unbridled, you know? Like, I always end up getting my feelings hurt thinking that people actually want the, the truth. The truth. Until it becomes uncomfortable. Mm. It's, cute. it's cute when the ratings... I, I, was, you, I can't tell you how many times I was told the ratings spike when you're on. You know, if you if y'all remember back in the day when I had the, the MSNBC contract before I was sat down for like a year uh, paid that I was on just about every show, you know, like they would bring me in. I would just be sitting there, even with Tiger Woods. You know, I remember sitting there. I was like, I don't know anything. I don't really cover golf. Okay. Like stuff I didn't know anything about, which was also baffling to me. My 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 strong suits were child welfare, which is what I covered, and education, which is what I covered. Yeah. I really do much of this stuff in music because I, you know, would do stuff at the Daily News for extra money. But I would be sitting there, but it was the hot takes. It was the expressions. You know, it wasn't even anything tangible that I was saying. And I didn't know half the time what I was talking about, but, you know, because I quick. But it was wild to me that, you know, you're sitting in this in this space and you realize this is not about anything other than the theater. 
the left, right, the, you know, the, the battles. This is WWE with, with supposedly smart people. Which you shouldn't have to remind people, but as you reminded them yesterday, it's fake. Oh, yeah, wrestling. <laughs> <fake. I'm sorry. laughs> Scripting. I mean, I mean, the fact that you still have to remind people, right? I mean, The Rock is 100 years ahead. 100, you're 75. But I mean, come Roderick on. Said, Roderick said the NBA, too. So if we're going to go there, let's go. Sure let's go. Like, let's, wait, it's all on. fake. It's all fake. Yeah, you see, uh, you see, uh, 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 what's his name out there for the Dodgers, the pitcher? His, uh, his interpreter is hurrying up with that plea. So he can, uh, cause you know, Pete Rose got about five more months and his, his, the new buy on Pete Rose. I got in the other room. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. It's like, boy, yeah, y'all, y'all done paid too much money for this uh, Japanese transport to, to have him have a scandal. So this man here got to take this. He said, yeah, I did it. I stole. He didn't speak English. Okay. So you can't, what's the, what's the, what's the word Japanese for money? <laughs> he, he, he wasn't missing his money. I mean, so you why y'all. But no, <laughs> yeah, and, and there's an NBA player about to get hemmed up too on some uh gambling uh oh situation. I was reading about that yesterday. Yeah, this but it's all fake because, right, because people got right. hemmed up in but there was a whole scandal prior in the 1920. Like this is America. This right. is America. This is America. The hypocrisy, you know, it's interesting. Um OJ, as they said, grew up in the uh what they call the uh, what is it? Uh, Potrero Hills, Potrero Hill Projects um, in San Francisco. And that area has been gentrified now. And I was looking at uh, an article in the Guardian newspaper from 2016. Um, there was it was an article on a mural that had been painted there um, near the cultural center, which is still there. And it had been defaced. The, the O.J. Simpson was put there. It was like a bunch of athletes who were famous and things that are famous. People who came out of Petrero Hill Terrace, uh, the, the the project, the housing project, and O.J. Simpson was one of those people. But then, of course, it spray painted murderer and spray painted his face out and put the red circle with the line through on it. And you know, looking at it, it just really was heartbreaking because the brother who manages the cultural center and you know somebody y'all can look it up I'll, I'll, I'll try to look it up in a minute if i switch over to the, the, the computer to look it up but he was saying you know that you have a development now a housing development a, a partnership with the city of san francisco and the state of california right now where they are creating affordable housing right the idea is that the people who still live in those housing projects, some of which have been torn down now and turned into these million and multi-million dollar homes because the hill overlooks the bay, after all. Uh, those people have been dispersed. They can't come back. That is a story all over the country, but they're fighting hard to make sure that that's not the case. So there'll be some market rate, as they say, unaffordable housing. And then there'll be some affordable housing. People can be, I think, 30 to 60% of what the regular market is, which still prices most of the people who live there out. And then there will be, uh, there's a guarantee that the folks who will be temporarily displaced can return. But we all know how that works. And this is all being, well, much of it is being funded privately. But I bring it up because, you know, we talk about whether or not there are certain hills we want to die on. And one thing was clear, <laughs> Orenthal James Simpson was not going to die on Potrero Hill. In fact, uh, what the brother who runs the center said was that, you know, O.J. Simpson was just another athlete. He said there was, his brother said there was some stuff in between, but O.J. Simpson was just another dude from the projects who got in trouble, made mistakes, and went to jail. There was some stuff in between. Like, wow, that's a harsh thing. He's a black dude. It's a harsh thing to say, but O.J. Simpson never came back to the community when he could have come back to the community. And that is a governance conversation. The minute folks who come from outside of black communities come in and say, see, that's because, I, I, that's because, you know, like you all were saying, OJ Simpson was not a good person. Keep talking. Yeah, because see, he didn't come back to your community because then he had the chance to come back to your community. Yeah, you ain't got nothing to say to us because every headline in all the newspapers leading with Infamous, infamous murder, infamous, infamous, infamous. I thought the guy was acquitted. Yeah, but then he was convicted. No, he was convicted in civil court. 
That's preponderance of the evidence standard. That's not beyond a reasonable doubt standard. And you moved it to Santa Monica. All you got to do is look at the jury pool. The jurors in that trial, you know, Ron, Ron Goldman's father, Fred Goldman, you know, bragging about that. We had to get that trial somewhere where we could get a different jury, you know, a fair and partial jury, you know, a non-black jury. Uh, that jury that convicted uh, O.J. Simpson with a preponderance of the evidence held him liable the wrongful death you had a uh, it was a black juror who was a postal worker in his 30s he's born and raised in jamaica uh, he said he watched simpson's criminal trial for entertainment only um white woman white male white woman white woman hispanic woman in her 30s says she didn't pay much attention to the criminal trial but she said that simpson's relationship with nicole brown simpson was dysfunctional uh, then uh, there was a black woman, grandmother in her 60s, told attorneys that sympathy for Fred Goldman, the father of murder victim Ron Goldman, she had sympathy for him because it's a parent's worst nightmare to have your child die before you do. So she got seated. Uh, then there was a white man, white female, white woman, white man. Oh, yeah, man. And then uh, there was another guy who was racially indeterminate from what I saw. But they got the right jury. And it's a much lower threshold. So, you know, by then, Marsha Clark was a TV commentator you know, making her bones. Poor Chris Darden. Oh, Chris never really caught fire. You know, a man caught hell for that too. But you know, hey. Where is he? That's a great question. I mean, what, didn't Sterling, Sterling K. Brown played him, didn't he? Pro, didn't, didn't he? Pro, you yeah, know, killed it. People versus O.J. Simpson. Oh. I mean, everybody, it, it's amazing to me. And his birthday, his birthday was last week too. Oh, oh, Sterling K. Brown? No, Chris Darden. April oh, Chris Scott. Darden. Chris, okay. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing how many people ate off of OJ, continue to eat off OJ. The court, TV. court TV and court all that. TV. Somebody right. in Nubia let us know that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, court TV. And and still, you know, here's a guy who did a stretch. And Maurice Claret, if you all remember the history of Maurice Claret at Ohio State, caught up again, gambling and all this other stuff, dismissed from the team, um, caught up. And did a stretch, and he made this point in in the in the uh, the podcast with uh, it is what it is. He said, you know, there's something. He said when he started talking with OJ, he said I only was going back and forth with him on social media. He said, but then when we started talking, there's something people share who've been to jail, who've been to jail as a celebrity, and he was nowhere near as big a celebrity as OJ. And you think about who African people are to others. And who we are to each other. And you realize that there is a story here that we are obligated to plant to, 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 to discuss because subsequent generations cannot access this genealogy, this white nationalist social structure for any reliable sense. And so it creates a dissonance where people say, I know I don't really feel like this is it, but I don't have any, any grounding. So we're going to do that today for a little while, just for, for a few minutes. So this is where the, the African States framework becomes very important. Having jailbroken the academy in general and the black academy in particular, we are free to use our tools the way they have to be used as broad tools to allow us to think together with stripped of all this class presumption and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, this brother coming out of the projects in, in San Francisco, this is what he says about himself. One of the books that was not in storage. I'm like, I'm surprised it wasn't, but I guess it knew it needed to be around. This is um the first book O.J. Simpson co-wrote with Pete Axelheim. You know that name. At the time he was at Sports Illustrated and then he moved to Newsweek. This is called O.J., The Education of a Rookie. This is the book that was published in 1970 after O.J. Simpson's rookie. In fact, it's the first edition, first printing of the book. This is O.J. Simpson the education of a rich rookie not even can you tell us a story of how you uh, acquired that book dr Cole? this one is a book i got many 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 years ago i was still living in philadelphia at a library sale um you can tell that it's a library sale. i paid a dollar 99 for it because <laughs> the uh the library is marked out in black marker here so a collector would say this book is not um, as valuable because it's got black marker in it. But I don't buy books to collect them to just sit around. I buy books for reasons like 
what we're doing right now to read them and to use them right so yes so that's that that was that's probably 30 years ago almost so we know that right you always gotta go to library sales library sales when people deaccession like this book had never been shelved it never even made it to the shelf you see because there's no library tag on it and you can see library tags mcmillan so this this book they never even bothered to put on the shelf there's a whole politic of what happens in libraries there are books that libraries acquire and for some reason or another, they never get tagged and put on the shelf. Maybe the librarians decide this is not something I want on the shelf. Or maybe they never get around to it. And then when they had a library sales, they just deaccession them. Or maybe this book actually was contributed, was, was donated for the library sales. A lot of times library sales, particularly now that libraries have been destroyed. Um, and by destroyed, I mean they threw all the books away. This is something that I've seen at Howard, in particular at university level. But you see it uh, in public libraries as well. When they call them deaccession, it just got rid of the book, and it's not because the book now is digital. Wow! They just got rid of the book. I'm like, so, wait, wait, wait. So how do you know that's the first printing and the first? Well, because it said. It, I mean, because if you look, where because um, people need to know that. Oh yeah, absolutely. So when you open a book, obviously, the first pages are usually just for protective, and sometimes it'll have the uh, the title there, and then you go over here over the flyleaf, OJ Education of a Rich Rookie, OJ Simpson, Pete Alfelheim, and the publisher, McMillan Company. And then on this, the verso page, the left page, here's the dedication. He's dedicating this to his children here at that time, Arnell and Megan. Well, yeah, Arnell. And then here on the verso page, it has the date, copyright 1970 by O.J. Simpson, all rights reserved, McMillan Company, Library of Congress, car uh, number 70 12, so forth. And then underneath it, it says first printing. Sometimes it'll say first edition. Sometimes it'll say first printing and then publishing in the United States of America. So this was in the first batch of printed in the first edition. I didn't even have to say first edition, first printing. So that's one way there. And there are a lot of different ways. In fact, in a book I'm going to talk about in a minute, this is a second edition of a book uh, that has been republished and added to. This just came out. And, I, and, I, and so I got this a mm, couple of weeks ago. Uh, this is called, of course, this weekend, The Legendary Caddies of Augusta National, Inside Stories from Golf's Greatest Stage. This is War Clayton's book. So, again, you see title page there over. Come on, you see the title page again and the publisher. And then here on the left-hand side, the so-called verso page, you will see all of the publishing information here. You see the copyrights, all that Library of Congress number. And this one, copyright 2024. Now, it's interesting because it was an earlier edition of this book by another printer, a uh, publisher. And it, so it doesn't it doesn't give you the information of the book previously. Let me see. Did, 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 did. No, no, not right here. Uh, I should mention, of course, this is the Masters weekend. Um, people should if you get a chance, look up the Augusta six. The Augusta six. In fact, I'll tell you about a little bit about them so you can get you started, because, you know, these were black caddies who worked for Augusta National. Uh, for many, many, many years. Let me see if I can find it quickly. Um, do, 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 do. Let me see here just for a second since we're on it. And then I'll put this matter. We'll come back to OJ. The, oh, here we go. Inner city black communities were fed up that spring. This is uh, 1970. About how basic city services in Augusta, such as repairing poor roads and water and sewer work, police brutality, and neighborhood violence were being overlooked. On May the 9th, 1970, Charles Oakman, an intellectually disabled 16-year-old black boy, died in the Richmond County Jail, Augusta's home county, with evidence of torture revealed over the next couple of days, even though the police said his death had been an accident, whatever. Shades of the LAPD. Sandra On Bland. May 11th, say it again. Sandra Bland. Sandra Bland. Sandra Bland, for sure. No question. Let's keep that same energy for black death. Commentators. On May 11th, a three-day riot began with Black Augustans demanding justice as they marched through the city in what is touted as the largest up urban uprising in the Deep South during the Civil Rights era. The riots came, this is white boy writing, <coughs> so I'm going to edit for him. The insurrections came one week after student shootings and deaths at Kent State University and three days before student killings at Jackson State University. I was just looking at that Jackson State book the other day on, on the Jackson State uh, killings. More than 2,000 people marched on Augusta government of offices and law enforcement facilities. This is where the Masters is played. Y the protesters also burned and looted businesses in downtown Augusta. Mm -hmm. 
white police officers were given permission to fire on protesters. Six black men were killed, all unarmed, shot in the back while running from Augusta police, the Georgia State Patrol and the National Guard and more than 60 protesters were injured. The deceased men were forever labeled the Augusta Six. John Bennett, 19, was one of those killed on the tragic night of May 11th. A neighborhood friend, Walter Newton, 16, lamented the lack of discussion about difficulties in the city. The 70s riot wasn't documented in general history books for another 50 years, and the Department of Justice finally announced in May 2022 that the cold case would be reopened. Final sentence. Newton indicated that Bennett and his twin brother James were his 1970 role models simply by their job choices. They were both caddies at Augusta National, Newton told the Augusta Chronicles. So we start talking about the masters. It ain't just Tiger Woods, friends. It's all these brothers who were caddies. This book talks about how uh, during the time, you know, think about this when you see silly uh, minstrel movies like uh, The Legend of Bagger Vance. Uh, I didn't see in the legend of Bagger Vance something that apparently was quite a ritual at Augusta uh, National. This is what, in fact, let me see if I can find this quickly. I just want to tell y'all what they would do at Augusta National. Um, back hole position. Uh, you know, James Brown is from down there. Right. So let me see. And my mama. And your mama. This is your mama territory. Yeah, my uncle caddied there too. Oh my God! You know what? Is your uncle still with us? No, he's not. And oh. I was just sitting here thinking these are conversations. This is why it's so important that we no talk to our elders. This is a conversation I would have had with him had he. But you know what? Transition. Now that you know, and everybody, I think we can all expect at some point you're gonna talk to Ward Clayton. It's an excellent book, by the way. Mm. I'm not just because he's he interviewed. He might have interviewed your uncle, quite frankly, because he talked to as many of these black caddies as he had. This is the second edition. But check this out. He said, during the early days of Augusta National, in the mid to late 1930s, before on-property accommodations had been built there, an all-white group of club members was regularly entertained off-site at various Augusta hotels. I bet your uncle knows about this, knew about this. According to David Owen's 2003 book, The Making of the Masters, which was written with Augusta National's blessing and archival access, club employees arranged for musical groups and dancers to perform when members requested, you can imagine. Who those groups were and who those dancers were. They also drafted area young men, shades of Ralph Ellison, hold on to your seats. They also drafted area young men for an all black boxing brawl in front of members at a hotel ballroom. Such wagering contests for these all black fights were somewhat commonplace among private golf clubs throughout the country. The free for all was particularly rogue, demoralizing and demeaning with the boxers, most of whom caddied or worked in the kitchen or dining areas at Augusta National. My God, can't, oh, I hope your uncle never got caught up in this, but my God, often being blindfolded and asked to combat each other in groups comprised of six to 10 fighters until a winner was determined by those dropping mm -hmm. out or getting knocked out. Onlookers chided the fighters with taunts of black boy or black bastard during the fracas and eventually made contributions, some by coins or bills thrown into the floor of the makeshift boxing arena for survivors to accumulate. He goes on to talk about one brother who ended up being a welterweight champion who came out of that. It's, these are caddies, brother working in the kitchen at Augusta National. So yes, you got races like Fuzzy Zeller when, you know, Tiger Woods, the champion, gets to pick the, the dinner for the current winner. He said, yeah, I'll go put chicken or wild or whatever they like. He's a racist. Yeah, you don't know the half of it, friend at Augusta National. So at any rate, the legendary caddies of Augusta National. So you see there, that's how the copyright pages work. And you can see it, the, what they call the verso page, the left-hand page in most books. It'll tell you when it was printed, what edition it is, this kind of thing. And if it's a first edition, sometimes it doesn't say anything. You can look at the numbers sometimes determined. But in the case of this book, OJ, the education of a rich, rich rookie, it says first printing. So here, let's just see what OJ is saying. In 1970, he's just out of Mr. Everything at the University of Southern California. He, this is his first year in the league. He does well, but he doesn't do nearly as well as he's gonna end up doing. He's in the debate, for those who debate these kind of things, about who is the greatest running back ever. Is it Barry Sanders? Is it Jim Brown? Is it OJ Simpson? Well, on a 14 game schedule, the case could be made that OJ Simpson is the best running back ever to carry the pig skin. And so, but he says this, he says, I am a 22 year old, Black, I am 22 years old, black, and lucky enough to be very talented at running with a football. 
In the year or so since I concluded my college career at the University of Southern California, I've earned as much money and made as many good friends as anyone could hope for. I have also suffered some bitter disappointments. I was not as good a rookie professional football player as I had wanted to be. My team, the Buffalo Bills, did not have a good season. But my difficulties in pro ball taught me a lot about the sport, about people, about myself. I'd be lying if I said that losing was a more enriching experience than winning. I expect to be a winner next year and enjoy it twice as much. Yet my struggles and problems have definitely been educational. And as I realized from my first days with the Bills, education is being is what being a rookie is all about. Simpson says, I have been praised, kidded, and criticized about being image conscious, and I plead guilty to the charge. I've always wanted to be liked and respected. Recognition has been far more important to me than money. Coming from a man who has signed contracts worth $900,000 in the past year, this may sound like an empty statement, but my oldest friends know how true it is. Shout out to A.C. Callens. May everybody have a road dog like AC. <laughs> but my oldest friends know how. See, again, y'all, these so structured people, all these Negroes twisting themselves up. Let's be clear. If the thing went down, you want to you want a cat like that that's gonna be what you came out the same place you came out. OJ says, and most of them understand why. He says, I grew up on Connecticut Street in the Potero Hill section of San Francisco. It was not the biggest, the poorest, the most explosive ghetto in the United States, but it didn't have to be. It still had all the problems and hustles and pain necessary to shape or twist the personality of every kid in it. I saw hundreds of those kids lose themselves in the hectic, anonymous struggle for survival. I saw too many take the easiest escape for Black people in this society by making themselves faceless and invisible. The ghetto makes you want to hide your real identity from cops, from teachers, and even from yourself. And it forces you to build up false images, humble or swaggering, casual or tough in order to handle your enemies and impress your friends. OJ says, I tried all the images. I stole hubcaps and started fights to prove my guts to other guys. I crashed dances and parties to show the girls what a big man I was. When I couldn't afford a jacket to wear my high school football letter on, I acted as if a letter jacket just wasn't the cool thing to have. Once I was dragged into jail for taking part in a street skirmish that, in those calmer times, shocked the police enough for them to call it a riot. At the station house, they, called, they asked me my name. Burt Lancaster, I blurted out. And since I had no identification, the cops believed me. They were never able to report my actions to my mother or my school. That's the same mother that the Goldmans and the Browns wanted her piano and her house. You want to know why O.J. Simpson busted up in the hotel room and said, give me my shit, include my mama's photo albums? If you black, you ain't even, you know the answer already. But you social, you folks in the social structure who want to make this man into somebody else, please understand this. In the middle of a situation where Human beings lost their lives and somebody else was on trial. But black people, it was never about OJ. Never about OJ. In that clip that you played at the beginning, one of them brothers said, that's my man. He don't know OJ. <laughs> <laughs> that's my man. Look, when James Brown, a son of Augusta, on the North Augusta side, South Carolina, that is claimed by both South Carolina and Augusta, Georgia, as James Brown said in Get Up and Get Up All, he said, don't you know? Don't do the work. Don't do no work. And then come to me. Don't stretch out your hand and say and expect me to call you a man. Don't stretch out your hand and expect me to say, there goes my man, unless we get up, get involved and get into it. But in that case, OJ's involvement was a reluctant involvement. He was a proxy for the rest of us. So when they said not guilty, he said, that's my man. What he's saying is you represent every time them funky hunting cops kill us, shoot us, harass us, bust in our houses, and then go to jail, and then everything is on us. You resisted arrest, or you didn't have a seatbelt on, or I'm just going to kill you and make some shit up. I'm going to go back to the squad car. We're going to say, what can we get them on? There's a license here. instead of a busted tail. Hold on. Oh, yeah, you got a busted light out here, and that's why we had to stop you. No, all of it. It wasn't about Colombian neckties and drug dealers and who was at whose uh, apartment or who was messing with who or who was at the restaurant and what time did the people talk? No, none of that. And guess what? For, 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 for adding injury to insult, this man had all the money to hire the dream team of lawyers. And then he put the black dude with the sharp suits, the Kappa, who went to public high school, L.A. high school, and stayed out there on the West Coast to go to law school. The guy who got Todd Bridges off. Some of y'all remember Todd Bridges. Think about Ice Cube, a bird in the hand. We talking about how crack infused the neighborhood. He said, now everybody's selling crack. Miss Parker, Little Joe, and Todd Bridges. <laughs> Everybody is in, caught up in the crack. He says, should I just wait for help from Bush? 
a Jesse Jackson, an Operation Push. You ask me the whole thing, need a dish, a Mac and Gale. What the what the hell? Crackle cell in the neighborhood to the to the, to the corner house. B words, Miss Parker, Little Joe, and Todd Bridges, and everybody that he knows. So I caught me a bird, better known as a kilo. Everybody caught up in the drug game. Johnny Cochran got Ty Bridges off when they was trying to jam him up behind assault and killing. Mm. Michael Jackson. In fact, before he took the case, Johnny Cochran, another other book that wasn't in storage. This son of Louisiana. Johnny Cochran, Journey to Justice. Johnny Cochran from Louisiana. Johnny Cochran said, I call Michael Jackson. What you think? Should I take this case? You know what Michael Jackson told Johnny Cochran? OJ needs help. Help him. I don't stop listening to these people on white TV. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about, about who these people is. Look, Jack Cotton kept Michael Jackson out of jail. You know what kind of hatred people in Los Angeles have? For, except Jack Cochran is a guy you couldn't hate. He's all friends with the police. I went to school with all these cops. Me and Tom Bradley, cool. In fact, Tom Bradley tried to lure me into city government to work. I wouldn't do it. He said, What well, about my law practice? The black cops, the ones that made friends with OJ, who take their white cop friends over OJ's house, Rockingham, the one that was flattened in the revenge tour. Those black cops knew Johnny Cochran. He went to school with a lot of them. He said they, they argued all the time, but they were friends. He got pictures in here. Remember this guy, this nails, nickel slick, nail back guy. Let me see if I can find his picture. because He got all the pictures in most places in the same place. Uh, Y'all may remember this name because, you know, when you think about the Rodney King Rebellion, and you think about these cops that got off. Let me see if I can hurry up and find these names. He got his wedding pictures in here. He's got when he's winning all these awards. Here he is with uh, Michael Jackson. One of these things just doesn't. No, but Michael Jackson, as OJ Simpson told Cam Ron and Mace, he said, even them light-skinned N-words can zip up their N-word suit. Every once in a while, you see Michael Jackson. Here he is trying to help. In fact, I love the caption he has. Here he is with Chris Darden in the in the courtroom. The caption reads, sometimes you try to give advice and it goes unheeded. So <laughs> that, was, that was his shade to Chris, poor Chris Darden. He's still getting beat up. And now that I think about it, I haven't seen Chris Darden on uh, on television. Hopefully, I, I don't know. I saw Marsha Clark. They, I, may, I may not have seen it. But actually, I want to start with this, though, just for a few minutes with this brother. Here he is with a brother that he starts his memoir with and ends him with. This is the great Jijaga Pratt, Black Panther, Geronimo Pratt. Mm. And he said, this was the case. In fact, let's let Johnny Cochran, this son of Louisiana, let's Johnny Cochran talk about this. He says, oh, well, I, I'm, I'm reading a little bit from the dedication. Um, actually, let's, let's, since we were doing that, since you had to do it, uh, this book cost me... Five dollars years ago. I have another copy actually because my mother got a chance to meet Johnny Cochran. Um, and at, I think he spoke at Fisk. This is the book Journey to Justice. But I found an autograph copy years ago. My mother loved Johnny Cochran, as did so many black people. Journey to Justice, there it is. Johnny Cochran with Tim Rutten. And here's the verso page again, the verso page. And this one, in fact, a little different, but you see. First edition, October 1996, there at the bottom by my finger. So he says, I dedicate this book as well, after he does to his family, to all those clients who have paid me the compliment of trusting me with the defense of their constitutional rights. As my parents gave me life, so these clients have given me purpose. I have done what I can to keep the faith with them all. He opens it. He says it was a sweltering day in early September 1972. I was 34 years old. I had tried and won 10 murder cases in a row. I had my confidence. I was on a roll. Then I agreed to defend Geronimo Pratt. Ger this is not Michael Jackson. This isn't Todd Bridges. This isn't all the celebrity cases. This isn't the all of his perfect record against LAPD and the prosecutor before Ornithal James Simpson said, come to my cell. AC man, get that man. Get a message to him, Rob. I need to talk to Johnny Cochran. And so, hey, I love Shapiro. You're doing a great thing, but y'all listen to Johnny Cochran. It's before all this is Geronimo Pratt, 34 years old. Johnny Cochran writes, Geronimo was innocent. We were friends. I'd never cared about a client as deeply as I did him. And now I was on my way to visit Pratt in the prison where the state of California intended to keep him for the rest of his life. What happened? What went wrong? As I was driving north out of San Francisco on that sweltering day, Pratt's trial was still fresh in my mind. As I headed for San Quentin, 
I replayed it over and over in my head. Most of all, I recall the moment less than two months before when Judge Kathleen Parker's bailiff had intoned the familiar all rise and we stood to hear the jury's verdict. He just knew they was going to win, knew they was going to win. My client, the leader of the Black Panther Party's Los Angeles office, had insisted from the start that this case was about something else. They have to get me, Cochran, he said over and over, and they're going to do whatever they have to do, end quote. John Cochran writes, but I was an experienced attorney. I dealt in facts, not, conspiratory fa not conspiratorial fantasies. With all they had on their minds in those turbulent years, it seemed somehow improbable to me that federal, state, and local authorities would plot secretly together to persecute a single Vietnam veteran whose worst fault was the taste for hyper hyperbolic revolutionary jargon. But as Geronimo and I stood shoulder to shoulder to hear his fate pronounced, why was my stomach heaving? Mm -hmm. And they found him guilty as charged to the crime of murder. And then he met he met him, and this is the last paragraph I'll read from this. Cochran said, I had come to San Quentin in part to tell Geronimo that he was going to keep fighting for him. He ends the book, by the way, not with O.J. Simpson, but with getting Geronimo Pratt finally out of jail. This is what he says. I had come to San Quentin in part to tell Geronimo that. The guard who escorted me to the three by four, five foot cubicle set aside for visiting lawyers and their clients smiled chillingly as he opened the door. This, he informed me, was the very room in which George Jackson had mm -hmm. handed a gun by his lawyer shortly before his final fatal escape attempt. Pratt was in solitary confinement where he would remain for the next eight years. And they brought him to me chained hand and foot. He wore a white jumpsuit with a huge, huge black X stenciled on his back. Cochran, he said, matter of factly, this thing on my back is a target. When I walk across that yard, if I fall now, they will shoot and kill me. They killed John, George Jackson. And that white boy couldn't wait to tell him just the room where the thing was set in motion to kill George Jackson. This is Johnny Cochran. And that soft white nationalist, Jerry Seinfeld, want to make a caricature of him in your Seinfeld movie? You and Larry David and the rest of y'all, uh, minstrel enabling uh, people. You know, live your lives. Go with God. It's a beautiful thing. It's on us. It's on us to be different. You can't make a your best lawyers couldn't defeat Johnny Cochran. You threw the full weight of one of the most racist cop uh, uh, enterprises, as Tupac once said, the biggest gang in the city against him. And he beat you over and over again. And the one you wanted more was loose. The juice got loose because of Johnny Cochran. And it wasn't because he was rhyming because he puts his whole closing statement in the Simpson case in the last chapters of this book. He goes through the jury selection process. He goes through the legal tactics and strategies they use, who to call, who not to call. When you read his account of how they worked that Mark Furman stuff and how he tried to save Chris Darden. Fool, you may, you know what I mean? We're going to win. But I'm not, and even after all that, and if you read uh, American Tragedy and some of the other accounts, Robert Shapiro, when you see the when you see them sitting there, we all remember OJ sitting there. The whole fight over was over too. Who's gonna sit next to him? Darden is mm -hmm. like, I'm running this. Shapiro, you get on the corner. And all of that, Cardassian sitting on the other side. You see the moment Shapiro leans over and says something to OJ. According to the accounts, Shapiro said to OJ, This doesn't look good. I think you may be going away. What kind of thing is that to say? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Shapiro. But you know what's so funny, Pro? We watched that verdict moment, those couple of minutes. These young people, I'm talking about 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds watching this. None of them had seen it. It's a different world. It's the same thing that we were talking about earlier, you know, when Baby Stat was like, I was born in 2001. I don't have any, you know, and she older than most of these young people. So they're watching. And then, you know, as the camera is curating this, zooming in on OJ's face, you hear his, you hear his, uh, you see his mouth move. He said, come on, come on. Every one of them black students in that class Thursday afternoon, bucks out laughing. And I pause, what y'all laughing at? He said, they wanted to hurry up. I said, what, what, what do y'all see in this man's face? And they started talking about all the anxiety, all of it. And I said, you know what's funny? We were at Georgetown. They wouldn't, have, they wouldn't have responded the way you were. Y'all are reading this man's face. You can see the weight. Any of y'all ever been in, in court? I don't care if you know you didn't do nothing wrong. You black in court. It could be parking tickets. It could be your cousin and them on some miss. It could be a disorderly conduct. With whatever it is, I do not like going to court. Every time I've been in the courtroom, whether it be now in Philadelphia jail, I think about my man, uh, Michael Cord, attorney Michael Cord, 
the revolutionary lawyer in, in, in Philadelphia, or anybody for that matter, who goes in court, when you go down to a courthouse and you don't see nothing but black people, brown people, handful of poor whites caught up in it, but it's almost always us in it. And then you go in the courtroom and you see a little wet behind the ear, uh, the ears prosecutors trying to get their win record up, ain't trying to make no deals, overworked, harrowed the public defenders, God bless them, down there, overworked, especially without the benefits of the state, telling people to take pleas. And they say, I didn't do it. I know, but this person over here is not going to make a deal. And people got to make split second decisions. They mom and them to put up their house. Their uncle done got off work. Their daddy sitting there. And that look on OJ's face came across the years and hit those young people in their soul. Mm. <laughs> it was like, and then it was like, and they said, not guilty. And you just hear him, like Cochran got his hand on him, whatever. Shapiro, whatever, man. Because this is your F. Lee Bailey. <laughs> F. Lee Bailey was hilarious. This Shapiro, oh. he called him in Florida, right? <laughs> F. Lee Bailey was messing up, making mistakes. He ain't the lawyer he was. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The young lawyer. But O.J. Simpson is like, look, man, black, black. I get that. I'm black. I'm black. But I'm not. I ain't black. This ain't about black. I'm O.J. I mean, Johnny, Johnny, I got you, man. I got you. But now it's a punchline because without the momentum of memory, right. we think the OJ was trying to escape the race and in a governance formation as we go now, not just who we are to each uh, other people, but who we are to each other. Sure. He was trying to escape, <laughs> but what that got to do with it. Right. Right. Once you get caught up, you can't escape. Right. This is what, in fact, the first interview he gave was with BET. It was January 1996. We sat down with our brother, Ed Gordon, Detroit Flyers. Mm -hmm. And he talked for over an hour on BET. It's on YouTube. And he says, I'm so appreciative of the support I've gotten from the black community. He said, but you know, 60% of the calls I've gotten uh, from, from have come from white people. You know, they're ashamed they have to identify as white. Ed Gordon stops him. He said, without due respect. Uh, I think it's clear the majority of white people think you're guilty. <laughs> Ed didn't let him off the hook, right? Yeah. This now. We're not talking, you're not talking to NBC, but you you your career is over, brother. Let's be clear. You can't run through airports with old white women talking about, oh, go OJ. You can't be in no more movies like the Naked Gun, one, two, three, or four, doing Pratt Falls over uh, a doll falling over when Leslie, whatever his name, and says, hit you on the back. Oh, that's over. Right? And they not finished effing with you. As most Def said in his song, Mr. N, he said, yeah, he said, uh, what was it? He said, OJ Simpson was acquitted by a jury of his peers. And they've been effing with that for the last five years. In other words, they ain't going to be satisfied till they get everything. Everything, they're going to buy your house, knock it down. They want your mama's piano. They want your mama's house. They want all your statues and trophies. I don't care if you put them in storage units, whatever, they're going to find this stuff. And then after that, after they hanging on you or they can't get your pension, no problem. They're going to find your stuff, put it on the internet or put it on the sports paraphernalia sports memorabilia circuit and when you find out a little bit of it is when it's a bridge too far then you're gonna then you're gonna show your behind except this time johnny can't save you johnny's on the other side now so what you gonna do right, right. you are gonna do what you always did you didn't decide it out of impulse when you was pacing the house talking about you was gonna kill yourself when you told him that you tried to do it but the gun didn't go off when you wrote the note that everybody all the salacious stuff that built the careers of everybody from nancy grace and star jones to greta van susteren and jeffrey tubin and everything in busy like you said court tv tmz all that salacious stuff that takes us away from the issue which was this was a proxy race war the latest in a 200 plus year, actually 500 year race war at the center of which is whiteness, which is declared war on all of our common humanity. All of that salacious stuff evades the point. It didn't matter whether you were trying to escape the black community because Ed Gordon didn't let you off the hook and we don't let you off the hook now. The fact of the matter is that you were chosen to be the avatar in the latest iteration of the 500 year running show called White Supremacy. And if because of that, when you were acquitted, the brother said, my man, that's my man. <laughs> Why? That's my avatar. This is Rock'em Sock'em Robots for real. And in this <laughs> case, you were the black robot. <laughs> so we had to have you. So, you know, it's interesting. Mesa Cameron was saying that uh, RIP Uncle O. And they said, when you said zip up your N-word suit, we knew that you was hood. And he, when y'all said that 
even you told us that we used the n-word a lot we received that we understood that and i thought to myself can you imagine who else who else y'all who else could get away on the day it was announced that orange law james Simpson? who else could get away with saying r.i.p uncle o can you imagine if stephen a smith or and i'm just naming him because he's in constant conversation with me i don't know that unc could say that mm -hmm. uh, you know, R.I.P. Uncle O. No. Or even Chad Johnson, who I thought, if you all get a chance, you know, again, you surf and stuff. Somebody sent this to me, social media, and I had to send it to Kathy Adams, Angie Porter, two fine AKAs uh, in the AKA tradition. Um, I had to send it to them because um, they did, a, I guess, Unc and, I mean, what am I saying? Shannon Sharp and Chad Johnson were in their, whatever they call their thing, after hours, whatever. And Chad Johnson was so effusive in talking about how his daughter had just crossed the previous week, AKA at Prairie View. And he said, I, I, he kept trying to say to Shannon Sharp, who went to Savannah Statement, who got caught up when he was caping for Dion about, you know, say, home, bro, don't forget, you went to HBCU and he's proud. He's got to, now you got to really show your pride. But Chad Johnson, he was so. He was like, I never, I never saw anything. I never saw anything. My daughter, oh baby, I was so proud. And they came out in the spotlight, and all the people had come from the other schools, and they was there from Alcorn, and they was, and they was all down. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't. Then when they came out, I start, I, I was back there. I started doing a step, and then I started putting my pinky up. They said, and my wife, um, uh, her mother was like, hey, you can't do that. Do that. <laughs> I wanted to do the call. I was like, skin it. No, you can't do that. He was like, that's what I understood. Only at an HBCU. Now it still wasn't a classroom. It still wasn't, a, but the thing caught him up so badly. And meanwhile, Shannon Sharp, like, yeah, bro, you understand? Yeah, bro, you understand now? Oh man, oh man. He kept saying it, it made me, he said, it made me want to go back to school. He probably could have said it made me want to go to school. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite sure when he was running, was it Florida State he played for? I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember either. But I, I don't think classroom work was part of it, but at any rate. It was fascinating to watch, but of course, neither one of them could say R.I.P. Uncle O, because in this society, while people are doing whatever they're doing in social media and doing everything they're doing in the newspapers and on television, black people are just going to be quiet because the moment, the only moment that the whole world saw what black people really think, well, that was 1995. <laughs> and in that moment, we forgot, yeah. we forgot to show who we are to other people and what we saw was who we were to each, each other, other each other and so yeah uh ed uh ed um ed hatter is the name of the brother uh Petrero hills he said you know there was big stuff in between there was big stuff in between there was big stuff in between but this is just now he ended up just another guy from the hill who did something wrong and wound up in prison uh they have something called the naib building the neighborhood building there and they have annual fundraisers in October trying to save the nave name the nave building, which is a famous structure. It's the community center, but gentrification has surrounded it. So I mean, you know, there's there's a lot more we could talk about. Obviously, in terms of movement and memory, there's the OJ that probably I'm sure you remember this, and there are many more here who remember when OJ Simpson was in Roots. Yes, <laughs> you know what I'm saying they got every celebrity OJ running around, yes. there, but in West Africa, you know? Africa, yes, you know, and uh, it's interesting because the symbols of movement and memory. Uh, somebody posted that right on that waterfront where we all were this summer when we all through you know in class and sitting there near the banks of Montgomery, uh, in, uh banks of the river there in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, apparently, somebody has placed a white chair as a monument <laughs> down, <laughs> down on the bank. So it's what is it about these white objects, white Broncos, white chairs. I mean, the whole idea that there's, <laughs> there's something about this idea that these, these material objects become place markers with all the work of our brother, Brian Stevenson down there in Montgomery with the statues and, and the jars of dirt from where people have been lynched and all the important work of remembering that he is doing. How is it that the work of resistance not represented through statues by Kehinde Wiley or anybody or, or paintings or, or, or dirt or, or monuments or names itched, all of that important work, but a simple white plastic folding chair. <laughs> Somehow. Why? Because it is not the ass whipping monument. It is a true monument of resistance. 
because in that moment, I will put this chair on you and it becomes a monument. Right. So, yeah, we, you know, I, well, I, I'll end with this. Uh, we, we, we have an ancestor, a new ancestor, our brother Bill Strickland, uh, the great uh, William Strickland, who uh, for many years was on faculty at the University of Massachusetts comrades with uh, everybody from Ernest Allen and Esther Terry. These are all people that Kathy Adams went to school with. Uh, the great John Bracey. Um, I knew Bill uh, Strickland. Everybody called him Strick. Strick was one of the young lieutenants at the Institute of the Black World. The reason that y'all we are dressed today, because I had my James Brown shirt on and I remember I had mentioned to you, Prof, that uh, when I leave here in a second, I'm going down to uh, Shallow Baptist Church here right down the street from Carter G. Woodson's house on 9th Street because today is the memorial for Dory Ann Ladner. Um, and Dory Ladner, New Strick, um, her sister Joyce, of course, who will be grieving with the rest of us and celebrating Dory's life, uh, New Strick very well because when they were young scholars together, they were members of the Institute of the Black World in Atlanta uh, under Vincent Harding at the Martin Luther King Center and then independently uh, Strick made transition uh, this week. And one of the things that Bill Strickland often said was that knowing dates, historical dates and events is important, but it's really meaningless until having acquired some knowledge of that stuff, you learn how to string it together. He said it's the stringing together that gives the meaning to dates. Memorizing dates really doesn't tell you much. 1776, 1906, whatever you want to say. Those dates don't take. It is how do these things relate to each other? And so we're thinking about O.J. Simpson. It isn't about a trial in 1995 or a, a car chase in 1994. It isn't about a conviction in a civil trial or it isn't about a conviction in a, in a subsequent criminal trial that allows you to lock him up. Ultimately, it's about the narrative of what it means and putting those things together in a much larger art. So I want to use those words from Bill Strickland to, to end today. It's how we put it together. And we have to do that here. It's, this, it's, is, this is what this is. You know, you, you brought up Geronimo Pratt and yes. and George Jackson, who I didn't mm. know until you we 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 studied with him mm. and, and his mother's letter. And, you know, you 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 make it meaningful, mm. you know, and it's not just, you know, stats and facts and people. You know, today, I hope there's a young lawyer in law school who's inspired to do the work, because the other thing which is negative that Johnny Cochran did was make lawyering famous you know people oh, saw right. a pathway to book deals and television contracts and yes and that became the the chase not the work johnny cochran could only get to that point because of the decades of work that he put in that voir de, de, what 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 is the the, the picking up what, the jury yeah, yeah when you voir dire is when you you yeah. can you can you can dismiss jurors for cause or you can dismiss the, what they call peremptory strikes and voir dire, he and this was the gamble he took. Once they got, he said, we were hoping to get four black people on the jury. He said, but as we kept going, I realized, I think we can get some more. Then when they got to six, the rest of the team, including his people, his black people, that his first, yeah, okay, no, now I'm going to keep going. He said, they're going to overplay their hand. He's looking at Marsha Clark and Chris Darden. I got them. And he said, we got number seven, because he's he, he said, I'm looking at the pool, because every time you dismiss a juror, they got a pool and they replace and he said, I see black women in the pool and it's majority black women. Now it's most, now it's almost all black. I'm going to try this again. I want jury number 198. Okay. And then, <laughs> and then Marsha Clark and them. Okay, we agree. A black woman comes in the seat. Ah, that's seven. He said, I'm going to go for one more. He said, stop. No, no, no. Everybody calm down. I want jury number six. Marsha Clark. Okay. Another black one. He said, "Okay, now we can quit." And then, so you got eight to twelve. I mean, this is a re but that, but 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 since you raised that, don't go anywhere because we we about to wrap up. But I want to. This is from chapter fifteen. It's called a duty of conversation. It's like the ancestors guide this because you said that about celebrity. He said the acquittal of O.J. Simpson triggered a discord which continues to roil throughout our nation. When the outcry that followed the verdict rose with such force, many of my friends and colleagues advised me that the best course of action was to take a low profile. You are a lawyer, they said to me. You've done your job. Now that the professional talking heads, the guys with the word processors fight this thing out. You've got the glory. Why take the lumps? Cochran writes, on one level, that certainly was sound advice. I had and have other cases to try. Other clients who need my help. An attorney in that position can have worse things said of him than, quote, well, I don't much like him or particularly care for what he did in that case. But if I ever get into trouble, I'm calling Johnny Cochran, end quote. 
And yet some deep part of me insisted that daring, not prudence, was the virtue required by that moment. That thought crystallized with greater clarity when I read one national columnist's remark that, quote, Johnny Cochran is a good lawyer, but a bad citizen. So I said that to say this, what you're raising is very important, Prof. So he made the decision. I'm not backing up. I'm going forward. So I will talk. He was doing commentary on O.J. Simpson before Simpson said I want him because he thought, why didn't he come to me first? I see you went to Shapiro, but he didn't he didn't press for it. In fact, he was telling his firm, I don't know if I want this case, because at first they thought he did it. Some of them. But at any rate. I'm raising this for this, for folks who, like you said, look at this and say, oh, this is glory. I'm going to get on TV or I'm going to be a famous lawyer. Here's the thing you got to understand about Johnny Cochran and and people like him, women and men like him. When you see them, what you don't see is all the years of hardcore work. What you don't see is him passing the California bar the first time because he told his wife and they had a, a new baby at the time. I can't take this but one time. I don't even know if I got the money to take it the first time. What you don't see is him spending and bleeding, bleeding himself from the time he was a little boy. His mother and father saying A's were celebrated after we moved from Louisiana to California. B's, every B, we sat down and had a conversation. Why? Now walk me through what happened and why this ain't gonna happen again. What you don't see is the intellectual work he poured into undergrad and law school. What you don't see is the apprenticeship he served with the city attorney. While he was taking the bar, he had to work. Him and his wife had to work. They, then they got a baby on the way. What you don't see is the deep mastery he took from the city attorney into private practice. When his wife was like, I don't know if you're going to private practice, you can retire from this job. He said, yeah, but the people need me and we need, we need people to represent us. What you don't see is his decision to take being a defense attorney when he could have made a whole lot more money doing other things. No, I need to do it this for our people. What you don't see, in other words, is the years of sacrifice and deep intellectual work. So people who think, okay, I got my degree. Let me get on TV. You done made a mistake. That's not who Johnny Cochran was. I don't care what Jerry Seinfeld tell you. Yeah. Well, they didn't make a mistake because people are given platforms to people that have no depth. So Fact. this is the world that we're in right now, but we have to reject it. Those of us who care about uh, truth, knowledge, facts, you know, the, those of us that care about that, those of us whose vibration is higher, we, we, we must reject the people that they thrust upon us who have no depth and only want the fame and the success that haven't done the work. Um, we shouldn't celebrate that or embrace them. But yeah, I appreciate yeah. that. And and you even dropping these breadcrumbs for us. That that that's this work, right? That's this it work. Is. So it is. um you have you've read the whole book and then many others that you have in storage. <laughs> so yep. those who would never crack open a book now know so much more about Johnny Cochran. And this conversation about OJ is not really about OJ. It's about us, right? It's not about OJ. It's not about OJ. It's about us. Thank you. Thank you. Listen, and, and we are addressed, like you say, because yeah, Mama Dory, Yes. For those who want to come, looking beautiful. Oh no, is, you're breaking up. Well, you have to repeat that because you you went out. Those oh, of, those of us who those who want to watch the uh, the live stream, I just dropped it in both chats. Um, that is the live stream for Dory Latner's service. Uh, the visitation with family starts at 10 a.m. Eastern. The service starts at 11 a.m. Uh, you're going to see if you tune in. Uh, members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee from all over the country, the world. I imagine that everybody able to travel is going to be here for that. Um, um, I don't know that she'll be coming back, but I do want to mention our sister, Donna uh, Marimba. Well, it used to be Marimba Richards, now Marimba Ani, who was here last week, uh, a member of SNCC. She's in that famous picture standing next to Dory in the front of 16th Street Baptist Church uh, that we talked about. And also, I, I, I do want to mention one unboxing. I figure since we're going to keep it up in terms of books, uh, Ben Caldwell was in town last week. This is Holly Garima's friend. They were in the L.A. Rebellion uh, together. This is his book, Chaos Theory, the Afrocosmic Arc of Ben Caldwell. If you remember uh, last uh, summer um, when we were out in L.A. for the 10th anniversary of Black Lives Matter, and I got to call my sister. Prof, I'm sure you saw that. Uh, I think many probably people saw that Cornell West had asked and she accepted Melina Abdullah to be his vice president's running mate. I got to call Melina. <laughs> like, sis, what's 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 going I on? I saw you know, that. I didn't yeah. talk about it because sometimes <laughs> you can be quiet. Sometimes well, you ain't got to talk about everything. You ain't got to talk about everything. Okay. In, you know. in, the so, in, the, in the social structure that I'm in, yes. there's a lot of things I do not talk about. Yes. 
Yes, I understand. I have opinions. And, and I have I'm, opinions. I'm, no, that's right. And I, I, I call my sister. They walk me through the lodge. But that was the only reason I was in L.A. And we all went out there. Of course, we did our class in class from there. And then afterward, uh, the flags, Baba Flag and, uh, and Mama Suzanne took took me over to see Ben Caldwell's daughter and the place that he has out there. And he was showing me San Copa City in Lamert Park. And, of course, Ben Caldwell, this is his book, Chaos Theory, where he's talking about that work. And then him and he and Hiley. Uh, had this long conversation on Thursday night. It's on Sankofa's website if you want to watch the conversation. And I would encourage you to watch it because it's about institution building. How do we build institutions? And the whole time they were having a conversation, I was sitting there thinking, this is what we're doing. We are building institutions. And Ben talked about that. He said, money, they would have, they had this whole debate about resources. And Holly is like, you know, to finish my films, I need resources. He's got this 10 hour maroon project he's working on all the stuff is there it's now got to be put together but you need money for that sound and editing and mixing and all that he's finishing up his uh his film on the italian ethiopian war of 1934 he's got it all he every day he's in there working you need resources you got to find some grants you got to raise some money you got to have these screenings and then try to get and carl was like oh that's important and you need it he said the most important thing the most important thing is that we step out on the faith that we can support each other and build. He said, I've lived my entire life that way. That's how I got the building in Lamert Park. And he talks about this. Y'all go watch as he talks about this. He said, I didn't have any money. My credit was bad. I didn't have any money. He said, but I stepped out there. I put something together. I had a little artist in residence money. And the lady who had the building was like, I don't want the building to go to these other people. I want it to go to you. But I just put a bid on the building with that little bit of money. And he just talked, I mean, what we're building here is on so much more sound footing than what the Ben Caldwells of the world and the Haile and Shriek Garimas of the world had to work with. And so it's our duty and responsibility now to seize this time, to seize this moment. We wouldn't be able to have this conversation otherwise. So Absolutely. again, Prof, thank you, bless you, love you, Absolutely. because that vision and our capacity to come join you in it and work together gets us to the point where we can do this kind of work. Couldn't, and see, a th couldn't see a thing until I saw you. So vision requires community, period. Uh, your vision is expanded exponentially by the people that you surround yourself with. So I'm so grateful that you are here. Uh, we're going to usher uh, Mama Mama Latner into uh, Ancestry. And, yes. and uh, thank you for ringing the bell. Yes. yes. Ring the bell. All ring right. the bell. We ring right. the bell. All we'll right. let that, we'll let the echo of that bell represent others who have made transition. Because I will admit to not being a Cameron or, <laughs> but hey, we balance. <laughs> so love you. Love you. Love you too. So we'll see everyone. Uh, we're going to end this the way we began it. We're going to play. Beautiful. It yeah, all right. All right, y'all. Oh, no. What did I do? Okay. Where is it? Dr. Carr, where are you? Okay. There we go. I'm not, all right. I'm, yeah. All right. There we go. All there right. Play. There it is. There it is. <laughs> Today. Superior Court of California, County of Los Angeles, in the matter of the people of the state of California versus Orenthal James Simpson, case number BA097211. We, the jury in the above entitled action, find the defendant Orenthal James Simpson not guilty of the crime. Yeah, yeah, that's my boy, though. That's my boy.